ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the School World Order. I am your host, the Dallas professor, John Kleisig, author of School World Order, the Technocratic Globalization of Corporatized Education. Greetings, everybody. Today's report is going to expand on the thesis of my book, School World Order, the Technocratic Globalization of Corporatized Education which breaks down the ways in which the education technology industry is advancing two ulterior agendas. The first being to data mine students in order to develop artificial intelligence algorithms and social credit databases. And the second being to engineer a new transhuman species. So my book examines a series of evolving education technologies, beginning with screen-based technologies, then moving to wearable technologies, and then eventually to implantable technologies. So in particular, the book first examines screen-based technologies known as adaptive learning courseware, which data mine students' cognitive behavioral algorithms, or in other words, their thinking algorithms. Then the book moves on to examine socio-emotional learning biofeedback wearables, which are wearable technologies that data mine students' emotional algorithms, or in other words, their feeling algorithms. And then the book moves on to examine the ways in which these cognitive, behavioral, and socio-emotional algorithms are being data mined and aggregated through machine learning, deep learning, and other AI learning programs in order to develop artificial intelligence systems that can be integrated into the internet of things and the internet of bodies combined together into an internet of everything that will manage predictive social credit analytics to track and trace students' biopsychosocial algorithms in real time through their brain-computer interfaces linked up to the AI internet of everything. So for today's report, I want to show you the ways in which the United Kingdom's open university and an online digital learning platform known as FutureLearn have been instrumental in developing the edtech building blocks for this AI transhuman social credit infrastructure. In particular, I'm going to show you the ways in which the Open University, which partners with the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, has been at the forefront of developing early iterations of internet networks and early versions of video conferencing courseware, both of which are collectively the bedrock of the blossoming edtech industry. Then we'll fast forward to the present to examine how FutureLearn which partners with Open University, is advancing the transhumanist agenda by platforming virtual reality wearables. We'll also examine the ways in which FutureLearn is advancing social impact financing, which is a cornerstone of social credit economics. And finally, last but not least, I will document how both the Open University and FutureLearn are connected to the World Economic Forum and the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, otherwise known as UNESCO. Okay, so a little bit of background to help contextualize this report before we dive into the details regarding Open University and FutureLearn. So this report is going to expand on the research that I compiled and explicated in the article that you see on your screen here in front of you. From UNESCO Study 11 to UNESCO 2050, Project BEST and the 40-Year Plan to Reimagine Education for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Now, I encourage all of you to read this article in its entirety at Unlimited Hangout, but for the sake of contextualizing the current report, I'll just give you a brief summary of that which is most germane to our analysis of the Open University and FutureLearn. So this article basically takes a deep dive into two education technology initiatives that were launched in the early 1980s. The first being Project BEST, that is Basic Education Skills Through Technology, and the second being UNESCO Study 11. So Project BEST was essentially the United States of America's domestic version of UNESCO Study 11. And the only reason we actually know anything about Project Best is because my mentor, Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet, who also wrote the forward to my book, she blew the whistle on Project Best while she was working at the Department of Education under the Ronald Reagan administration in the early 1980s. So what you see on the screen here is a promotional flyer for Project Best. This was distributed internally throughout the Department of Education. Here is a physical copy 
of the report in its entirety. And when Charlotte came across this, she discovered that the Department of Education's Project Vests was designed to set up public-private partnerships with big tech corporations that would replace academics with workforce training through computerized Skinnerian teaching machines programmed with operant conditioning algorithms. So in other words, Charlotte discovered early schematics for what is now the online adaptive learning industry in the fourth industrial revolution. As I've documented in my book and in several articles, adaptive learning courseware, which data mines students' cognitive behavioral algorithms, is the modern digital version of the analog Skinner box teaching machines that were designed by behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner in the 1960s. Project Best was also primed to advance the globalization of adaptive learning courseware through what would become the World Wide Web. In 1982, during the rollout of Project BEST, the USA's Northwest Regional Education Laboratory set up the Resources in Computer Education, otherwise known as RICE database, which was made searchable through the International School Practices Information Network, otherwise known as SPIN, operated by BRS Incorporated. So according to a SPIN advertisement, SPIN provides access to over 1 million educational resources and an international network of educators all accessible with a microcomputer and telephone. Here's an image of that advertisement. So while Project Best was focused on developing a domestic American ed tech industry that could interface with a global information technology infrastructure, UNESCO Study 11 was focused on developing the global IT infrastructure that could integrate the domestic ed tech industries of America and other nation states. So UNESCO Study 11 was basically a collaboration between Western capitalist nations, Eastern Bloc communist and socialist nations, and multinational technology corporations, including Microsoft, Apple, and IBM. So the goal of UNESCO Study 11 was basically to combine the corporate globalization of Western capitalist nations with the centralized statecraft of Eastern Bloc communist and socialist nations. So UNESCO Study 11 actually built on an earlier ed tech initiative that UNESCO launched in 1977. This was titled Development of Educational Technology in Central and Eastern Europe. And it was in this particular document that UNESCO declared that the centralized statecraft of communist and socialist nations was the ideal method of instituting the future system of ed tech schooling. So in UNESCO Study 11, the role of the communist and socialist nations was to further develop that centralized statecraft for the purposes of ed tech implementation. The role of the Western capitalist nations was to leverage their multinational technology corporations in order to set up the global IT infrastructure that could traverse the borders between capitalist, communist, and socialist nations. Fast forward to 2020, and the centralized statecraft of communist and socialist nations was exploited on a global scale as the World Health Organization directed the entire planet to mandate lockdowns that forced everyone to utilize the global e-learning infrastructure that was facilitated by the big tech corporations of Western capitalist nations. So we see that in the fourth industrial revolution, UNESCO Study 11 comes to fruition through the synthesis of corporate globalization and communist central planning for the purposes of installing a worldwide system of ed tech cybernetics. Okay, so now how does UNESCO Study 11 connect with Open University? Well, in several Study 11 white papers, the Open University's model of distance learning was endorsed as an ideal delivery system for piloting experimental online courseware products. All right, so let's take a closer look at the Open University and how it set the mold for distance learning, which is now ubiquitous with virtual online learning. All right, so it says, in 1969, one ambition changed the world, giving anyone anywhere the power to learn, established by the Royal Charter and globally recognized. The Open University has pioneered distance learning for over 50 years, delivering exceptional teaching and outstanding support to students across the UK, and the world. So you may be wondering, how did the Open University facilitate distance learning? 
1969 before we had the World Wide Web and ubiquitous personal computers in everyone's household. Well, back then, distance learning courses were basically correspondence classes. So you would just basically communicate through letters with the university. So uh, an instructor would send you some learning materials, uh, maybe some textbooks, and then perhaps some prompts, some assignments, uh, maybe some math problems or some essay assignments or something like that. And then you would uh, complete those assignments and then you would mail that back to the instructor. The instructor would go over them, give you some grades, some feedback, mail that back to you along with uh, the next stage of the curriculum. And then you would continue on until you had completed the course. Later on, as audiovisual technologies would evolve and as audio cassettes and VHS tapes became more readily available to consumers, the written correspondence from the instructor would oftentimes be replaced with a recorded lecture either on the audio cassette or the, the videotape. And the student would then use those materials rather than written materials to correspond with the instructor. And this is keen to note because when we take a look at the Open University's involvement in the development of the Cyclops video conferencing technology, you'll see that the infographic schematics that we'll be looking at basically demonstrate that these early iterations of video conferencing technologies were basically nothing more than a television, a cassette player, and a telephone cobbled together with a microprocessing computer and a modem. So basically, for the last 40 plus years, the main objective of the ed tech industry has been to augment the old audiovisual technology industry with microprocessing computers. And the result is that Today, distance learning and virtual online learning are synonymous. There are no longer any correspondence courses that fall under the distance learning umbrella, whether through written correspondence or through audio, video, cassette correspondence. And with the help of global education technology initiatives, such as UNESCO Study 11, the UNESCO Global Education First Initiative, and the UNESCO Global Education Coalition, with the help of the Open University, the result has been that distance learning is now synonymous with virtual online learning. All distance learning courses are now facilitated through courseware and video conferencing platforms on the World Wide Web. And not only did UNESCO Study 11 endorse the Open University's distance learning model, but currently the Open University is actively collaborating with UNESCO. So this woman here, Catherine Jewett, she is the Open University Associate Lecturer and she has been appointed co-lead of the Education and Digital Skills Team within UNESCO's Inclusive Policy Lab. And at the same time, the Chancellor is the Baroness Lane Fox of Soho. And she just happens to be a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. There she is right there, Martha Lane Fox, UK Digital Champion, United Kingdom. All right, so let's take a look at some of the UNESCO Study 11 endorsements of the Open University's distance learning model. So we're looking at my database here on the screen. You can access this through my website, schoolworldorder.info. So let's navigate our way to the UNESCO Study 11. Okay, so this is the descriptive overview of the multinational study known as UNESCO Study 11, otherwise known as New Technologies in Education, Information and Communications Technologies and Their Impact on Education. So this white paper was authored by the United States of America's UNESCO liaison, Lawrence P. Grayson. And this file was given to Charlotte, who then gave it to me. 
along with several other UNESCO Study 11 white papers issued by the various nation states involved in the initiative. So throughout the course of UNESCO Study 11, there were a total of 17 participating national commissions, but Grayson only procured white papers from nine of the participating national commissions. And those included white papers from Denmark, Finland, France, Hungary, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, Spain, and Sweden. Okay, so here are physical copies of the UNESCO Study 11 national reports that were given to Charlotte. So we got some from Spain, another one from Spain, one from Italy, another one from Italy, this one from the Netherlands. Another one from the Netherlands. One from Sweden. Another one from Spain. Another one from the Netherlands. This one is from Denmark. Another one from Denmark. This one is from Finland. This one from France. Another one from France. This one is from Hungary. This one from Poland, another one from Poland, again, another one from Poland, and then one more from Spain. So in the reports from Poland, Spain, the Netherlands, and Finland, there are several endorsements of the open university's distance learning model as the ideal delivery system for experimenting with burgeoning computer-assisted ed tech products. Okay, so let's just take a look at some of these endorsements here. So let's start with the study 11 report from the Netherlands. Okay, so this study 11 report from the Netherlands is concentrating on the ways in which the Netherlands can transition from audiovisual ed tech to computerized ed tech. And there is an entire section devoted to exploring the prospects of the Open University's distance education model as the ideal delivery system for streamlining the new wave of computerized ed tech. So go ahead and read this section here. It says, the Open University has recently designed a strategy for the integration of media and distance education. The choice of media has been based on the following three factors. One, analysis of the functions the media have to serve in the teaching process. Two, finding the optimal combination of medium and teaching functions. The most important criteria are A, presence of the medium at the student's home. B, cost of purchasing the medium by the student and by the Open University. C, the degree to which the medium allows future changes of the learning materials. D, the degree to which the medium admits exchange of materials with other universities. Three, analysis of the existing media on the market. The Open University expects the following media to be present in 1987. A, at the student's home, an audio tape deck, TV, telephone, video recorder, programmable pocket calculator. B, to be acquired by special groups of students for use in the open university courses, video recorder, microcomputer, Viditel, teletext. C, only to be used in a study center, large computers, VLP, retrieval systems for literature search. Four, also optically readable records will be used. The order of introduction of media. One, immediately, optically readable records, teletext, audio tape. 
two, after some technical and organizational preparations, TV, computer as computing tool, Vitatel. Three, in the long run, videotape, computer-based learning, and VLP. Based on these considerations, the Open University has decided to integrate media and education in the following order of preference. Written materials, audiovisual materials, computer software, personal contact. Okay, so this is a nice summary of the ways in which the Open University during the era of UNESCO Study 11 was concentrating on evolving its audiovisual system of ed tech into a computerized system of ed tech. And it's also during this era that the Open University was working on developing the Cyclops video conferencing technologies, which would cobble together audio recording, video recording, and telecommunications technologies with microprocessor computers that could facilitate video conferencing courseware through a proto-dial-up internet. Okay, so now let's take a look at the Study 11 report from Finland. Okay, so this white paper is titled New Technologies in Education, Review of Applications in Finland. And this one explores the prospects of several burgeoning computerized ed tech products, including a talking computer known as Didata, which has been taken into use in both special education and so-called normal education. The Didata equipment consists of a central processing unit, a keyboard, a speech synthesizer, a cassette unit, and a printer. The report then goes on to declare that computer-based education systems and teleinformatics would create new possibilities also for distance teaching. They could be exploited in the open university, for example. So again, we have the promotion of the open university's distance education model as the ideal delivery system for streamlining the new generation of computerized ed tech. All right, so next, let's take a look at a Study 11 report from Spain. Okay, so this white paper largely focuses on Spain's transition from audiovisual ed tech to computerized ed tech. So in a section titled, Current Use of Video Technology in the Spanish Educational System, this white paper explores several video production companies that specialize in educational media. And one of these companies is known as Ancora Productions, which at the time of this white paper in 1984 was the exclusive agent for the Open University, the splendid BBC production. So the Open University partnered with BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, and Ancora Productions. And yes, the Open University continues to partner with the BBC today. So you can see here on their website, it says, unique partnership with the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation. For over half a century, the OU and the BBC have been co-producing inspirational content with a mission to bring learning to life for millions of people. Okay, so now let's take a look at the Study 11 report from Poland. Okay, so this white paper is titled Joint UNESCO Project of the European Region, New Technologies in Education, Information and Communication Technologies and Their Impact on Education, UNESCO 11, Poland National Report submitted by the Polish coordinator, Alfred Andris. So like the previous white papers that we've looked at, this Study 11 report floats strategies for transitioning Poland from the old system of audiovisual ed tech to the new system of computerized ed tech. So it says, treating education as ability to self-instruction, to lifelong education, one should expect school to provide pupils with the following. So it's got several bullets here. And then after the third bullet, it says the equipping of schools with technical devices, possession of these devices by schools and their constant usage in didactic processes can shape the technical abilities and habits of students. The equipment of schools with audiovisual devices can't be too expensive. Necessary equipment should include TV set, videotapes, and cassette tape recorders, and in future, computers. 
And in pursuit of this transition from videotapes and cassette tapes to computerized ed tech, this white paper highlights the role of the radio and TV open university for teachers. So it says, at present, the Committee for Polish Radio and Television is working on the future structure of the open university. Poland has many experience on this field of activities because from many years till now, the radio and TV open university for teachers is at work, as well as the radio and TV secondary school of agriculture. Now, to be sure, this radio and TV open university may in fact be an offshoot of the United Kingdom's open university. So in 1969, the UK established the first official open university. Thereafter, numerous other nation states have instituted their own versions of open universities. So here is a list of open universities across the planet. We've got Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania, Sudan, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Bangladesh, Turkey, India, Saudi Arabia, Palestine, Philippines, India, Vietnam, Iran, South Korea, Nepal, Malaysia, Israel, Sri Lanka, Russia, Philippines, Thailand, Japan, Indonesia, Pakistan, Australia, Greece, Ukraine, Spain, Turkey, Serbia, Netherlands, Cyprus, Canada, United States, Barbados, British Virgin Islands, Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela. You'll also notice here that almost every one of these colleges is a DL or distance learning college. The DL stands for distance learning. PC stands for physical campus. So almost every single one of these open universities emphasizes distance learning as opposed to classroom learning, although some of them do also have a physical campus and then occasionally some of them only have a physical campus, but the vast majority of them emphasize distance learning above classroom learning in person. Okay, so now let's take a look at the open university's involvement in the development of the Cyclops video conferencing at Tech. Okay, so here are some hard copies of some of the academic journals, white papers, and research abstracts detailing schematics for the Cyclops video conferencing technology. So you can see this first one was published by the Open University. The title is Cyclops in Schools, a Small Pilot Study, a Report for the Microelectronics in Education Program. Then we have another white paper titled The Effects of Microprocessor and Telecommunications Technology on the Open University's Teaching and Administrative Systems. And you can see that this report is also copyrighted by the Open University. And if we take a look at a section titled What Technologies Could Help, we could see that the Cyclops video conferencing technology is listed therein. In this document, we have a catalog of research abstracts. So the title of this document is Program Institutional Research 1982, which collates an exhibition and a series of seminars of research and development directed at improving the teaching and operational effectiveness of the Open University. And if we flip this open to page 12, we'll see here an abstract from the Cyclops group. So it says, Cyclops is an audiovisual system based on the conventional television set, standard audio cassettes, and microcomputer technology. Again, cobbling together the old audiovisual technologies with microprocessing computer technology. So it goes on to say, it uses the facts that microcomputers can process pictorial information in a digital form and that this information can be stored on an audio cassette or sent along a telephone loan, telephone line. So in other words, it has a data capturing feature in the audio cassette recording mechanism. And then it has a proto internet network through a proto dial up internet connection via the phone line. So it goes on to say the Cyclops terminal can be used as a video text terminal, Prestel or Optel, or as a color graphical terminal for computer assisted learning. 
Terminals can also be linked directly in electronic blackboard mode and a light pen used to write on the television screen. Finally, the terminal can be used in an electronic tape slide mode to replace sound and animated diagrams from a standard audio cassette. There's also a big brother of the Cyclops terminal called the Cyclops Studio. This allows one to draw graphics and diagrams and store them on audio tape or computer systems. And then under services, it says, we have from time to time a small number of Cyclops for short-term loan and can advise on open university purchase prices. So here we have another collection of research abstracts. Again, this is published by the Open University. If we turn to page 128, we'll find an abstract from a research paper that promotes the use of the Cyclops ed tech. So the title of the paper is Applying New Technology to Distance Education, a Case Study from the Open University of Difficulties in Innovation. And the abstract reads as follows. Cyclops is a good example of the possibilities for education on new microprocessor technology. Cyclops also provides a good case study of some of the difficulties to be encouraged in innovating with new technology in large educational institutions. The system is briefly described, followed by an analysis of the financial difficulties encountered in moving from a prototype to a developmental stage, the teaching functions, the way the tutoring would be organized, regional acceptance, and difficulties at local centers with the technology itself are described. Finally, a number of general observations are made about the problems of innovation arising from this case study. All right, and so this last one is a journal article authored by a Diana M. Lorillard, who was a lecturer at the Open University. The title of this article is The Potential of Interactive Video. The abstract reads, interactive video combines two well-established media, video cassette and computer-assisted learning in an attempt to combine the advantages and overcome the deficiencies of both. The paper describes a feasibility study of the medium using a package that includes a video presentation intercut with interactive computer-assisted learning programs on the subject of signals and communication technology. The necessary hardware is described and two ways of authoring the educational software are compared. Finally, the educational implications of the new medium are discussed together with a consideration of the logistic and administrative problems it presents. So this article does not actually examine the Cyclops version of interactive video, but it does examine other schematics for alternative versions of interactive video courseware. So here we see a diagram detailing one method for interfacing VCR, audiovisual, TV technologies with a microprocessing computer drive. So here are some screenshot images of various learning modules transmitted through an interactive video courseware system. Okay, and then here is another diagram that lays out schematics for interfacing audiovisual technologies with microprocessing computer technologies. So this last journal article here along with all of these other journal articles, white papers, and research abstracts, were given to Charlotte by Lawrence P. Grayson, the same guy who gave her all of the UNESCO Study 11 white papers. And in fact, these documents were collated in the same manila file along with all of the other UNESCO Study 11 white papers. So in other words, Grayson was highlighting for Charlotte the ways in which the Open University's development of Cyclops interactive video courseware was part and parcel to UNESCO Study 11's development of an international IT infrastructure that could facilitate the globalization of digital online learning. All right, so let's take a look at some more of these Cyclops schematics. Okay, so this Open University paper lays out an infographic that diagrams the Cyclops main studio. So this iteration of Cyclops includes a video input involving a camera, a cassette recorder involving a microphone, three monitors, a VDU, a black and white monitor, and a color monitor. The VDU lists instructions 
shows choices available, black and white monitor previews the work, and then the color monitor displays the completed work. Next, we have a bit pad with a light pen that can draw freehand graphics. Then we have a keyboard, which can control the computer commands. It can type text onto the screen, and then it can store or retrieve information from the computer, which is the last device that we have up here. You can see it has a couple disk drives, and it's this computer that interfaces all of these other various audio-visual technologies together along with the light pen and the bit pad. Next, we have the Cyclops Mini Studio. The main differences between the Mini Studio and the Main Studio are that the Mini Studio has only one monitor, whereas the Main Studio has three monitors while the mini studio has two audio recording technologies, whereas the main studio has only one audio recording technology. This mini studio is also missing the bit pad, but it still has the light pen. The light pen is hooked up directly to the monitor and the light pen can write directly on the monitor. The two different audio recording technologies perform two separate functions. So the one on top of the table is for playback and recording of material created in real time. And the one under the table records a comprehensive log of all of the students' responses to all the various e-learning stimuli transmitted through the Cyclops courseware. The junction box basically serves as sort of a switchboard that controls the two different cassette recording technologies. And then the Cyclops box is basically the computer that interfaces all of these audio visual technologies together with the light pen and the keyboard. Okay, and then this last infographic here is a diagram of a possible future Cyclops setup in schools. So you can see that in this future Cyclops model, we have only one monitor, a color TV monitor, and only one audio recording device. The microprocessing computer, the keyboard, and the light pen are all integrated into a single device, which is hooked up to a telephone line that can facilitate an early dial-up internet connection through what was then known as the Prestel internet network, which linked up with other schools. All right, so now let's take a look at one more set of schematics so that we can examine how the Cyclops EdTech system was designed to facilitate digital distance learning through what is now known as the worldwide interweb. Okay, so this open university paper explores the ways in which Cyclops EdTech can enhance distance learning programs that used to be delivered through telephone teaching and telephone tutoring systems. Okay, so this infographic diagrams four different methods for facilitating telephone teaching and telephone tutoring. So in the first method, we basically have a simple one-to-one -one connection between a tutor and a learner, both of whom are operating from their own homes. In method two, we have a one-to-one -one connection between two learning centers. So we have one telephone connecting two different learning centers, each of which would host a classroom filled with a diversity of students who are guided by a tutor or instructor. In method number three, we have one tutor operating from his or her home using a conferencing bridge through which he or she can interact with multiple students who are learning from their own homes. And then in method four, we basically have a combination of method three, which utilizes a conferencing bridge, and method two, which interfaces two learning centers together. So in method four, we basically have one tutor operating a conferencing bridge that can interact with several different learning centers and all of the students and instructors in those centers. All right, so now if we scroll down a little bit here, we will see how the Open University advocated for replacing the old telephone teaching and telephone tutoring systems with Cyclops interactive video technologies. So it says, the lack of visuals and the strain and frustration caused by technical difficulties in using the public telephone system for group teaching have been 
some of the reasons why telephone teaching has not been more extensively used. Cyclops is seen as one possible way to overcome some of these difficulties. It has been invented and developed by staff at the Open University with assistance from a British firm, Aragon Limited. Basically, Cyclops converts a visual signal into a digitalized audio signal and or converts back a coded audio signal into a video signal by use of a memory store and a microprocessor. The coding of visual signals in terms of sound means that the visual information can be transmitted or stored on a much narrower bandwidth than that required by broadcast television. Thus, the coded visual signal can be sent down standard telephone lines, stored on one track of an audio cassette, or even transmitted as a radio signal. Cyclops does not have the full information capacity of broadcast television, but it can be used for drawings, handwriting, simple animated graphics, and still pictures fully integrated with a separate soundtrack. The Cyclops box is connected to an ordinary TV set by means of a standard RF aerial connection. A light pen can be connected to the Cyclops box. When the pen is pressed against the TV screen, a menu of commands appears on the screen. Draw, line, erase, wipe, see appendix number one. If the command draw is touched by the light pen, the screen can be used as a blackboard. Anything written on the TV screen could be sent down a telephone line if a telephone was connected to the Cyclops box or recorded onto a standard audio cassette if a cassette recorder was connected to the Cyclops box. If a stereo cassette machine was used, both sound and vision could be recorded on a standard audio cassette. These characteristics make Cyclops a very flexible medium already. It is clear that Cyclops could be used in one of at least three ways in the open university systems. So those audio cassette recording devices that we saw in the infographics for the main Cyclops studio, the mini Cyclops studio, and the future Cyclops studio, those audio cassette recorders can store not only audio data, but they can also store visual or video data. So the visual imagery produced by the light pen on the monitor, that visual data can be funneled through the Cyclops microprocessor, which can convert it into an audio signal that can be stored on the audio cassette. And then that audio cassette can be used to retransmit that audio data back into the Cyclops box or another microprocessing computer, which can then reconvert that audio data back into visual data that can then be displayed on a monitor or another television screen. Now, this is super important to note here because it shows that the early Cyclops prototypes for video conferencing software were from the get-go embedded with data mining features that have been carried over into the contemporary era of digital adaptive learning courseware and socio-emotional biofeedback wearables, both of which are primed to funnel all of those student learning analytics into social credit databases. All right, so if we scroll down a little bit more here, we will skim past another infographic detailing another Cyclops studio system. But if we keep going, we'll see that a long-term goal of the Cyclops project was to facilitate universal homeschooling through online digital platforms. So in the conclusion section, it says, it is still difficult to use home-based microprocessor technology. The most extensive new development in media after TV and radio for home use has so far been the audio cassette. Until new microprocessor equipment becomes manufactured on a massive scale and becomes universally found in people's homes, it will be necessary for students to use local centers. It is really essential then for Prestel to take off for domestic use since many other developments will follow in its wake. So they're basically forecasting here how Cyclops video conferencing technologies are primed to be universally adopted by homeschoolers across the globe as soon as the transistors and the microprocessing computer chips are condensed enough and made affordable enough that everyone can own one in their own home, while the school-based internet networks such as Prestel are expanded and integrated with domestic internet networks through what has now become the World Wide Web. Fast forward about 40 years to the present, and we have all of that. Microprocessors are now compact enough and affordable enough that pretty much every single human being in the developed world 
has, if not a personal computer in their home, they have one of these, which is basically a computer. The cell phone has access to the internet and it can even stream video conferencing software. And for those who couldn't afford their own personal computers during COVID lockdowns in the United States, there was a ton of CARES Act stimulus money that was funneled to schools so that those schools could then purchase tablets, laptops, or other computer devices that they could then loan out to students who couldn't afford their own computers so that those students could continue to attend government schools through virtual online distance learning platforms. Enter FutureLearn, an online digital learning platform created by none other than the Open University. So if we scroll down a little bit here, this is the FutureLearn website. The About page says, in 2012, the Open University founded FutureLearn to extend its mission to open education to all. So let's take a look at FutureLearn's partners. There's a ton of universities from all across the planet. And then we have an array of FutureLearn partners that are categorized as specialist organizations. So a few that are noteworthy include Accenture, which is a corporate partner with the World Economic Forum. So listed here under partners. Then we have Kaplan, which traffics in educational technology services. We also have the Lego Foundation. Here we have the infamous Tavistock Institute of Human Relations which is notorious for spearheading mass social engineering operations. If you're curious to know more about the Tavistock Institute, I recommend this book by Dr. John Coleman. The title is The Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, Shaping the Moral, Spiritual, Cultural, Political, and Economic Decline of the United States of America. Next, we have the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, and the UNESCO Unitwin Complex Systems Digital Campus. Then we have Welcome Connecting Science, which according to the Welcome Sanger Institute is funded by the Welcome Trust, which is a corporate partner with the World Economic Forum. The Welcome Trust is also institutionally yoked to the British Eugenic Society, which changed its name to the Galton Institute and then changed its name again to Adelphi Genetics. If you wanna read more about the connections between the Welcome Trust and the British Eugenic Society, you can read this article here on Unlimited Hangout authored by Jeremy Lafredo and Whitney Webb. Title is Developers of Oxford AstraZeneca Vaccine Tied to UK Eugenics Movement. FutureLearn also partners with VR Voom, Virtual Reality Voom. Now, so scroll down a little bit here. It says VR Voom has a specialist education team ready to empower future generations with the knowledge and tools to unleash creativity. VR Voom offers scaffolded learning programs for all learners based on a design thinking approach. They utilize their know how to provide interactive and engaging learning opportunities through a hands on practical approach. Their operations range from running location-based VR experience premises in Auckland, exploring VR content by remote learning or hybrid presentations, to licensing their own VR creations globally. So in the same way that the online digital video conferencing software that was prototyped in Cyclops was designed to basically be an evolution of the old audio-visual ed tech, Virtual reality or VR ed tech is going to be a comparable evolution of those online digital video conferencing platforms. So basically, instead of video conferencing through two-dimensional screens, you're going to virtual conference in a three-dimensional metaverse space. And all of the same key institutions, UNESCO and the Open University, which were instrumental in evolving AV ed tech into digital online ed tech, those same institutions, UNESCO and the Open University, along with the Open University subsidiary FutureLearn, are now at the helm of advancing screen-based 
video conferencing courseware into VR metaverse conferencing courseware. All right, so the last future learn partner that we are going to take a look at falls under the category of associate partners. And the one I want to zoom in on is called social finance. So what is social finance? Social finance is a not-for-profit organization that works in partnership with government funders and the social sector to achieve sustainable social impact at scale. So it's basically a social impact investment corporation. And social impact financing is essentially the main engine for driving a social credit economy. And if you want to take a deep dive into the ways in which social impact finance and ed tech data mining are part of the same social credit ecosystem, I highly recommend Alice McDowell's blog, Wrench in the Gears. Let's take a look at FutureLearn's data mining policies. Let's scroll down. What information we collect, name, email address, age, home address, date of birth, telephone number, country of nationality, other personal data if you choose to register for a FutureLearn account via third-party sites, including Facebook and Google, and have provided your personal information on those platforms, credit, debit card information, data relating to your use of our website and enrollment on online courses, information provided by you when you correspond with us, including via surveys, other information you choose to provide about your interests, educational background, occupation and work experience, learning goals, and other general learning preferences for the purposes of making course recommendations on our website, or if you've opted in via email and personalizing our services to your needs, information provided from third-party sources, such as our partners who may invite you to a certain course. So altogether, we're looking at some pretty comprehensive psychobehavioral profiling here. So let's scroll down a little bit more and take a look at how FutureLearn uses or shares all of this data. So it says, in providing our online services and products to you, we and third parties we work with will collect, store, and use your personal information for the following purposes. Let's see, 3.1.4, where you are invited by a course provider or a third party institution, such as your employer or a third party reseller to enroll on a course or courses to allow that entity to enroll you on the course or courses and to monitor and track your progress on the course or courses. 3.1.5, if you are taking a course for academic credit, professional certification, and or other formal recognition of learning to allow the university or other institution to monitor and track your progress to award you with the relevant recognition as applicable and to make direct contact with you regarding your progress and completion of the course. 3.1.8, for creating prospective customer databases by matching demographic data from your depersonalized information with members of the general public. 3.1.9, to use your information in an aggregated format to identify trends on our websites and trends in our customer database. We may use this information in an aggregated and anonymous format and may share this information with third parties. 3.1.10, in connection with campaigns with higher education institution partners to provide universities you have expressed an interest in with your personal information so they may assess common areas of interest between their students and future learn learners and improve their educational program offerings. Any such data gathering will also be pursuant to the university's own privacy policies. 3.1.11, to share general user data with our online course providers for research related to online education. 3.1.15, to personalize our services, the FutureLearn website, any email communications, and the FutureLearn app, so as to best meet your needs, for example, by providing tailored course recommendations. So FutureLearn is engaging in some pretty heavy duty data mining of its students. And it is also sharing much of that data with third parties, some of which could potentially be social impact finance corporations that could funnel social impact investments into future learn based on its cache of student learning analytics. And as FutureLearn branches out into virtual reality platforms, VR headsets and other neurofeedback wearables will enable FutureLearn to data mine an even broader spectrum of psychometrics. Eventually, according to Ray Kurzweil, 
VR platforms will be transmitted directly into a student's nervous system through his or her brain-computer interface. At this point, data mining through screen-based technologies and wearable technologies basically becomes obsolete as the entirety of a student's biopsychosocial algorithms can be directly data mined through his or her brain-computer interface, which can then funnel those psychometrics and biometrics into a social credit database managed by AI through the internet of everything. All right, so the last thing I wanna show you is a little peek at the Future Learn leadership team. In particular, I wanna take a look at the advisory board members, and I wanna zoom in on this guy right here, Sir Michael Barber. Michael Barber is also a member of the World Economic Forum. He's also a partner at McKinsey and & Company, and he is the chief education advisor for Pearson PLC. That's the Pearson Education Company. It used to traffic primarily in educational textbooks, but in recent years, it has expanded its operations and branched out into providing a vast array of ed tech products and services, many of which are scrutinized in my book, School World Order. So in brief, both FutureLearn and the Open University are overseen by members of the World Economic Forum. So Michael Barber is a FutureLearn board member. And if you recall the Baroness Lane Fox of Soho, who is a young global leader of the World Economic Forum, is the chancellor of Open University. And at the same time, both FutureLearn and the Open University are partners with UNESCO. So we can see how FutureLearn is basically the culmination of UNESCO Study 11. It's also keen to note here that the establishment of both the United Nations and the World Economic Forum can be traced back to the same historical origins in Lord Alfred Milner's Roundtable NGOs. For a detailed summary of that history, check out this book right here by Dr. Michael Rechtenwald. The title is The Great Reset and the Struggle for Liberty. It's worth noting here that I compiled most of the research for Chapter 8, which is titled The Roundtable Roots of the Great Reset, which documents the roundtable origins of both the UN and the World Economic Forum. These common roundtable roots of the UN and the World Economic Forum signify how the global ed tech innovations of FutureLearn and the Open University have been steered by the UN and the World Economic Forum to pave the way for the transhumanist ed tech panopticon of the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which are now being spearheaded by the UN and the World Economic Forum. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share. If you'd like to check out more of my research, go to my website, schoolworldorder.info, where you can find archives of all my interviews, all my articles, and a bibliography of all my citations. There's also links to all my social media and video platforms, and you can sign up for my email list too where you will receive notifications whenever I produce a new article, interview, or video. To support my work, become a research member for just $5 a month, and you'll gain access to my WebBrain database, which contains Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet's archive of U.S. Department of Education files and other rare historical documents. The database will be updated with weekly document dumps, and you will be notified whenever I upload a new dossier. Thanks again for watching. Peace.